Hello and welcome to Tarim Talks. I'm your host, Bob Rilchi. Episode 4, Dr. Muqaddas Midget has a PhD in ethnomusicology, and she teaches anthropology at Toulouse University. She's also an avid filmmaker, and she's working on a film about traditional instrument making in Toulouse right now. Before that, she was a dancer, a professional, at Xinjiang Institute. And now she tells the story of the Uyghur people and culture through real Uyghur dance. In this episode, we had a great conversation about personal values and the philosophy and approach that she has towards life and work. We're also going to hear a lot of stories of her projects with other people, such as Lisa Ross and Dulam Mukham, the musical group from Kashgar. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. I had a really great time talking to Dr. Mijit. She's a very insightful person, and I hope you all learned something. So, just um, just for everybody out who's listening right now, can you introduce yourself and let them know what you do? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, my name is uh, Muqaddas Mijit. So I was born in Urumqi in a family of uh, intellectuals, basically. My father was a chemistry professor and my mother was a journalist in um, Xinjiang newspaper, Xinjiang Daily. And um, I'm a uh, ethnomusicologist. I finished my PhD in 2015. And I was also a professionally trained musician and dancer. So before I came to France, I, I had I finished my uh, degree on uh, classical and traditional dance in Xinjiang Art Institute, and also I finished a degree on uh, uh, classical piano performing. Uh, and uh, I'm also a filmmaker, but it it came late. Uh, um, I was. Uh, the the field work that I, I had to do for my uh, master's degree in eth- uh, ethnomusicology. So I had to go back to homeland and I have to go back to villages and to to do research. So I started to use camera as a part of my research tool. So I recorded a lot of um, traditional dance, music and rituals um, in villages or in different parts of uh, Uyghur homeland. So I um I became um a filmmaker by doing ethnographic research and ethnographic films a, a little bit later and also I did some training on editing film editing so um and then I I found out like I I was really convinced that filmmaking is a very effective way of uh, telling Uyghur stories so that's how I became filmmaker. I did several ethnographic films. I did a, a documentary about a rock band uh, from Urumqi. And also I, I'm working on several other projects that will take place this summer. And I wrote a um, short film that I'm working on. So, yeah, um, that's the things that I do. I, I will consider myself self as an probably artist researcher because I do like different kinds of art. Um, yeah. So I think we can tell that you're just a, you're very busy. You're very involved. You have a lot of, you have a lot of uh, balls in the air, juggling balls mm-hmm. in the air. Yeah. It's not, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's very complicated for people to understand what I do because um, I do several things and people used to say, oh, you're lost and you don't like you didn't choose one thing and did it for your for your whole life. And um, I used to like get really um, disturbed by this kind of comments. Like people will say, oh, what is your like, what is your thing? And you do all these things. You're not like. Uh, specialized enough in one but um i think everything i do is related to Uyghur culture and whether ethnomusicology music dance or or filmmaking everything it's like i think i'm specialized i'm trying to be specialized or i'm trying to like using all these tools to tell Uyghur story that's 
what I'm <laughs> specialized on, you know? Yeah, no, I think that's completely understandable. Um, that actually is really interesting. And I want to dive a little bit more into it. You said that these kind of comments disturbed you a little bit. How, can you describe a little bit more about how they made you feel? Um, how, how I should like really uh, be clear when I say this because it's um, uh, it's a feeling that I struggled a lot with. Um, because when people tell you like, oh, you're not um, specialized enough, in a sense, it's like you're not good enough in one thing. Yeah, so there's like a self thought will come right right after this kind of comments. So sometimes I will doubt what I'm doing because people will say, "Oh, like why you're not just doing dance, or why you're not just doing filmmaking, or why you're not just doing music." So I will feel like, "Oh, maybe I'm not doing one thing enough, and then I'm not concentrated enough." So that's something uh, bothered me or like it it's not because of like the comments of other people. I think it's the doubt that I had in my in, inside of me. Like I was not self-confident enough to like step up to these comments in the past and say, hey, I'm everything I'm doing is like it's actually one thing, but I'm using different tools because I'm interested in learning. I'm in interested in like using different ways because um for me it's more exciting so that that's how it it bothered me a lot because also this kind of comments is very socially constructed you know like in a in different like i think we all live in in western societies like especially in france if i know like the the for the most um like it's very important here in French society that you have one major, you have one job, you're concentrated, and like people tend to put you in boxes. Like it's safer to be in one box. If you're jumping from one box to another, or you're like if you have several box, it's complicated for people. You know, like they cannot put label on you. Uh, for me, it was all always complicated to like put myself into one specific box because I felt that it was not enough for me. Uh, I rather like try different things and experiment. I think the thing which interested me most like in life or in all these forms that I, I, I explore is exploring itself, not like getting into one form because of like my uh like self questioning that comments became an issue in the past but like eventually now i made peace with these comments and i try to at least <laughs> yeah i think a lot of uh young young people out there kind of struggle with that feeling that they should specialize or dive into one field and just go all in and i don't think that's Mm. a specific thing to just France. I think that's all over the world. Mm. People people seem to value the master of one as opposed to the jack of all trades. Mm. Um, so how did you come overcome your self-doubt or the questioning of whether or not you were making the right choice? Um, I think it's when I... It was not long ago, but when I really like realized that everything that I have been doing for this 15 or 16 or maybe 20 or 25 years it's all around uh, Uyghur culture and also around like how to t tell the story or to like brought Uyghur culture to different stages so when I understood that when I really understood that what I'm doing all actually is one path so then i was like okay like i don't really care about all these comments so i think the the, the most important thing is to know what you're doing like in a in a deeper deepest level and deepest sense so then you will like be you can stand in your in your field and be strong and tell the world that yeah, this is what I'm doing. How do you 
get to that point? What did it take for you to um, come to that realization that what you're doing isn't just, uh, I guess, a phase, but rather what you're doing is serving the greater goal of what you want to accomplish? I think it took me years. And I think it took a lot of courage. And I think it took a lot of failure. I think it took like a lot of self-doubt. And also, I think I never really stopped believing in the process of trying new things or new tools or trying to to get out of my box. I think that's how I, I, I that's something that helped me to realize where I'm standing now and how to really believe in what I'm doing. So I I think I took some risks. Yeah. I think it's a, a life experience. I, I mean it's not easy. I think courage is the most important thing. Or if someone asks me any advice, I will tell them, like, don't stop trying. Those are very wise words. <laughs> very wise. Uh, uh, just to pull back a little bit. Um, so you discovered this this passion of yours, uh, t- telling stories of the Uyghur culture, preserving it. Mm-hmm. Um, what are the driving forces mm-hmm. that bring you to do that? What motivates you to continue this with every step that you take i should talk about like when i first came to france i came to france to study like of classical piano like i was accepted for a music school and i met with my teacher and we started all the processing of like being involved in this it was a very famous french school music school but very soon i realized that i was not the place that I I supposed to be. The thing is, like, I had a very major crisis, like identity identity crisis, because um, I knew all these classical composers, right? I knew where was Paris, where is France, and a little bit at least of French culture, and um, I I was willing to like put all my energy to learn French language. But no one knew who were the the Uyghur people. It was a big shock for me because um, before I came to France, I never had any clue of like how non known we were. Mm-hmm. So I was like, "Wait!" I grew up listening to Michael Jackson. I grew up dancing all these to all these tunes. I knew. Like I, I listen to all this modern music, and but at the same time, my culture, no one knew it. So, like the whole world knew all these musicians or all these artists from Western world, but no one really, really care about artists from Uyghur background. So I feel like this is unfair. We all like human beings, right? And we are. Like in the world stage, we don't have same same values, and um, in the beginning, I was like, like that's because I I was born in Urumqi, so I don't have the same like um, opportunity, so that's why blah blah blah. But I was like, wait, it's not where I I was born is a problem, but this world is very unfair. But at the same time, I will not to like victimize one myself. But I have to show to the world that how equal we are and how uh, creative we can be and how beautiful our culture as well to be judged or to be listened to or to be at the same stage or at with the same eyes as all these art- artists in or in Western world. I think for the whole 15 or 16 years, that's the force that really pushing me to go forward and to break through this glass ceilings for us as an Uyghur. It's our job to bring our culture to the world stage, to let other people see it, to share it and cherish it. That is such a a powerful influence. Uh, It's such a powerful Mm. motivator 
to to love a culture and to want to mm. share it, give it the representation and the attention that mm. it deserves, but that it yeah. clearly doesn't get. Now, is is this something that you were always interested in uh, as a child, even um, the the music, the filmmaking, the the culture? I think so. I think um, when I was in the in the um, elementary school, I think I was one of the the hyperactive kids. So, okay. like, I was always involved in all these cultural uh, classes or cultural events. And eventually, I remember like one of my earliest memory as well. Like in our neighborhood, we were like we had we were we were like. I don't know, 20 or 30 kids in the neighborhood, I would bring them all together and we will like prepare plays for parents. So I will spend like weeks and weeks to train them and to prepare uh, a music and dance play. And then we will invite all the parents from the, from the neighborhood and then give them a show, you know, and really like, I don't know where it comes from, but, um, I think I was like always interested in like stage and showing like what is beautiful and yeah. Yeah, I think I'm I was very interested in art like especially you know, in music and dance, but it's until I came to France that I really realized that actually Uyghur culture is also very beautiful and very valuable and we completely have right to to spark in the world. Why do you think that it took until you came to France for you to recognize uh, that Uyghur culture is so important to you and that it's something that you want to uh, share and preserve? It's very funny because I learned much more also in more deepest level about my culture, my heritage, my history after I came to France. Um, because like when I was younger at school, you don't really like, you don't have right to learn your own culture and it's all Chinese history or Chinese culture. And we had like very few information about what was the real history. And my mother like really loved to sing. And I, I grew up in this like very festive environment. Um, my mother always like I cook big dinner and you know I, all her friends and the, all these like singers and dancers and then they will just gather to in, in in our home and just sing the whole night I think I had something from that period because I I had this experience like from my family being in this context and being uh, in touch with all these artists and all these beautiful boys and singing and um I think my mother had also a big role in it because she was very, uh, she's a writer and she had a very like a special understanding of Uyghur literature and she would like cry reading a poem. And she also like her whole life, she wrote like things for to, to motivate Uyghur youth. Actually, that's what she did. Like even working in Xinjiang daily you know, like in each of her articles, she tried to like give people courage and motivate them. Uh, and then when I came to France, like I, as I told you, I came to learn Western culture, Western classical music. But um, I realized that I was not existed for the world, you know, like as a, I, as a Uyghur people. Um, and then I saw all these, um, beautiful concerts and festivals in Paris and they they will bring all this traditional music from all over the world and they were like uh, one night um, not far far from my language school uh, there was a, a concert from uh, Kazakhstan like Kazakh traditional musicians were there so I, I saw it like I was like oh this is like great stage why why they don't have Uyghur musicians the next day I met the the director of the theater who gave a speech before the opening of the concert. So I met him in a in a restaurant and then so I went directly to him and then I was like, Well, I saw a concert of uh, Kazakh musicians yesterday, but I can bring Uyghur musicians, traditional musicians, exactly the same. 
and why you don't have a um, Uyghur concert here. He was like, yeah, brilliant idea. Just let's do it. And then I spent a whole year to work on uh, bringing Uyghur traditional musicians. And um, we brought Dolan Mukam from Mekit. It was in 2004. A group of really traditional musicians from a village called Yantak. At that moment, I, I, I told myself, like, this makes so much sense. And this is what I have to be doing for the rest of my life. And it was such a beautiful music, such a special moment for me and for the audience as well. And then I had to like talk about Uyghur culture. And I was like, yeah, this is what I have to do. But I, I realized at the same time that I didn't know much about this music, this culture. I never been to Yantak. So I think that's how I, I started to really be like interested in, in Uyghur culture and to get to know it better and to understand it more. And it's very funny because I realized that the world ignored us. And at the same time, I, I realized that I ignored my culture as well. Yeah. It's interesting how when you're in it or involved or immersed, it can be harder to yeah. to see it clearly. Um, so I saw that you have a film of uh, about traditional instrument making in Toulouse. Yeah. Uh, so are you making the film in Toulouse about Uyghur traditional instrument making or is it traditional instrument making in Toulouse by uh, people who live there? Yeah, it's a very funny story. Um, uh, we moved to, to Toulouse with my husband three years ago, and we were like discovering the city because um, I lived in in Paris like for my whole whole life when like when I came to France. So it was new for us. So we were walking around, and then we saw there that that there was a huge uh, building called uh, Center for traditional music and dance we were like oh this is funny so we went in and they had um uh exhibition about um i don't i will not know how to say it in in english uh au bois um it's like a um, oboe oboe yeah the instrument yeah so it's um, um so they had a the the um, an exhibition of uh, oboes f around the world. So we were watching this. I was like telling my husband, "Oh, we have also the similar an instruments." And then what I see, there's um <laughs> oboes from Kashgar. Oh. In that center. Okay. And I was like, "Wow, this is crazy. They have an instrument from my uh, my region, this is crazy. And then I took the email addresses of the uh, director of the center. And then I wrote like six months after I explaining like I'm Uyghur. And then I saw this exhibition in your center. And I'm very interested in like getting to know you or to, to like to see if we can do something together and create um, uh, an exhibition or to do some performance or teaching and she received me in, in her office, and then we were talking, and then she said, "Well, yeah, like I understood that I understood that you're a singer, dancer, and you're a musician, but for the moment we don't really have something uh, like a, a project around that. But while well, you're also a filmmaker, so we want we had this idea of making a film about our in instrument making factory. So, are you interested in?" in doing that with us I was like why not so it was three years ago it took us like three years of negotiation of like trying to find some fundings and to do this film but uh, it's not about Uyghur, <laughs> Uyghur music instrument musical instrument making but it's about traditional music instrument making in Occitania Occitania is the region of around this Toulouse but it was so similar actually and it was like the, all these people that i interviewed they were asking themselves the same questions about how to preserve how to transmit how to make more young people to get interested in uh traditional music or the music that have been like that the ancestors has been like playing or making you reassured me as well in um in my belief 
of we all have beautiful cultures and we all have same problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is where I want to get a little bit uh, more technical into it. Okay. Um, can you describe the filmmaking process uh, from the the funding aspects to the filming aspect? How did you piece together this film in the storyboard? How did you edit it together? Mm. Um, uh, I can only talk about my own personal experience. Sure. Because there's so much different way of making a, a film. My perspective is always like how I can put all these different pieces together, how I can juggle around the sources that I can explore. If we talk about like traditional documentary filmmaking, right? Um, so you pitch an idea and you try to look at, look online if there's any institutions can like help, help develop your idea and to, or to go and, uh, make this film, etc. But um, founding from the institutions, from my end, from my uh, experience, it's very time and energy consuming because it's always very complicated. You have to really know what they ask and all these in- big institutions. They know exactly what kind of film they will fund. So in a sense, it's very selective and also very narrow. So... If you don't fit in, they will make you feel like your film is not good enough or not worthy enough to be made. So if you have an idea, it doesn't fit any um, institutional funding process. So it's okay. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. You can learn a lot by trying, sending all these applications, which are really complicated and Eventually, they will refuse your proposal and you will get depressed, but it's okay. It doesn't mean that your idea is not good. So sometimes I will talk to like people like the center, for example. It's not an institution of like filmmaking. Like They don't make films. They're, that's a, a center for traditional music and, uh, and dance. And they have their own way of supporting their projects. So it's not film but culture music dance a collect collecting or um, intangible cultural heritage blah blah blah. there's like different way of founding a film but um the application that they will send out it's not uh specifically about to make a film and also there's another way it's completely like um anarchist <laughs> you get your phone or your your camera or whatever you have just you film and you try to took some nice videos stable and good images and nice sound and you come back home and you download the editing program and you learn how to edit and you edit it and you put it online so it's also a way of uh, making films so Sometimes I do that. I sometimes I go somewhere and or I do like I I film my performances and I edit myself and then I just put them online. So okay. Mm. Um so when you're filming it yourself, uh your your performances do you just usually just set up a camera and yes, let it mm. record fixed position. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Or sometimes I, I work with some, some other people. For example, for, for one piece, I work with a, with a friend that I have been mm-hmm. working for, for five years, Lisa Ross. So it's a piece called, uh, Six Meters of Atlas in Brooklyn Bridge. So she was filming. I was not filming there. Oh, okay. Sometime. Okay. Um, so when you're making an independent film, you're, mm-hmm. What is your creative process there? Um, my creative process, I think, like when I make films, I have to be like, first thing is I have to be passionate about what I am filming. The subject, I, 
I have to like really understand. It's also, of course, it's a creating process, but it's like for me before uh, it be- become a creating process, it's a learning process for me. So, for example, for this latest project, I spent like maybe ten days like watching all the footages that I got and I like reading all these articles and really understanding what I'm what I filmed and how can I like get the best out of what I filmed. I'm a completely outsider for the center so I don't know all complex like um uh relationships in between like the people who created this uh, this place or the now people are working there and how they're like de- dealing with all these like technical issues and but I I spend like days to really get to know all these issues and really un- try to understand. Um, and then the creating part, creative part is, I will like search for the story. Of course, it's the story that people was telling me, but it's also my story, right? Um, I'm trying to tell their story, but from my perspective. I think it's it's the most honest way that you can create something when something became your story. I don't know if I make sense, but <laughs> it's like to understand uh, the story and absorb it, make it your own and tell the story in your way and from your emotions. No. Yeah. I think that makes sense because now it's not just their mm. story. It's it's how you're interpreting it. Yeah. But it, it's the interpretation with like a lot of knowledge and understanding. It's not just I'm watching something and then I'm saying this is this. But mm-hmm. I did my research, I did my homework, and I really, I think I really understood something. And I'm telling that part that I understood. Yeah. Not the things that I don't understand. Uh, could you Could you explain that? What do you mean by that? Yeah. I get really irritated when people like just go somewhere like this happens a lot, you know, like there's a specific field also for photography or for art. It's like uh, what they call it. It's um, cultural arts or something. Okay. So that means is like you go somewhere, you take some pictures and like somewhere exotic, for example, Mm -hmm. I really hate this word. But um, and you came back, and then you will tell people that you have your your own interpretation, and this is your story. But you spend like two days or three days in this place, right? So you suddenly become like this big uh, uh, specialist or the the artist to work on this on these issues. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't want to do that. I really want to get to know the the subject and the meaning behind it, and really like do research and understand it before I feel legitimate to tell this story. Okay. So it's very important to not just use other people's culture or knowledge, not responsibly. It's like this, I'm like very uh, sensitive about ethical problems. So I try to apply that. For me, because it comes from, you know, like uh, as an ethnomusicologist, I encounter a lot of uh, people who misuse other people's culture, for example, Uyghur culture or all this, like they will go and document two songs and then they will become like the biggest specialist or they will use it in their creations and they they will misuse it, and it's not very respectful for 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 Uyghur culture. And when you tell them like, "Oh, wait, this is not respectful," and they will say, "Oh, this is my interpretation, and this is my creation." Mm. So you really think that people should have a solid understanding of what they're doing before they do it? They can't just yeah, they can't dive in. It in that sense, they are posing as experts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's back out a little bit and, uh, go a little higher level. Uh, okay. <laughs> because we, we got really into the weeds there with the, the, the process of filmmaking. Um, mm-hmm. so, um, so you already answered this, but I'm going to ask you 
uh, again. Okay. Um, what is the most pivotal moment in your life or your career? I think I have several pivotal mo- moments. Um, uh, the first one that I, like the one that I told you, like when I met this um, um, festival organizer uh, in Paris, and at the same mm-hmm. time I realized that how less, that I know about my culture and how less the world know about Uyghurs. That was the first one, I think. And that brought, brought me to ethnomusicology because he is the one who told me, like, if you want to, like, uh, introduce your culture to the world, you should do uh, research. You should do ethnomusicology. It's the best way to, you know, like, to really talk about your culture. So that was one. I think the second one is when I, we didn't talk about this, but uh, when I, uh, when I um, uh, brought a festival curator to Urumqi and then we went to uh, the bar that Parhat Khalik was uh, performing and, um, and he, the, the curator was like blown away by Perhat's voice and his music and uh, really like I understood like it's not just only traditional or cult like uh, classical Uyghur music can touch hearts but it's also like musicians like Perhat or like um, the, these contemporary artists can have a very like huge impact and that was also the second one because it it took like from 2009 until 2016 we did like huge projects with uh, Perhat Khalak. And I think the last one, the last one is after my PhD I went through like a really bad, um, um, how do you call it? Um, depression because I didn't know what to do and with a PhD you don't find a job and uh, but I think it was the the performance that I did um, in January with my friend Lisa Ross in um, in New York when she uh, had her exhibition I Can't Sleep about Uyghur Homeland uh, uh, honoring Uyghur Homeland uh, I we did three days of uh, performative intervention, so from eleven a.m. to uh, six p.m. I did uh, with uh, Anthony and another musician. Like we did uh, performances uh, each hour, like at the hour uh, in each hour. So it was very powerful work for me and very healing as well in this very complicated time period. And uh, I was, for the three days, I was crying, uh, singing, dancing uh, at the same time. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just thinking. Um... <laughs> Yeah, those are powerful moments. Mm. Very powerful. Um, so, what parts of the Uyghur culture do you appreciate uh, and identify with? And which parts of it do you think need to be developed? What I really appreciate about Uyghur culture is its diversity. And the from one city to another, the musical rhythms are different, uh, modes are different, um, scales are different, and also what they're singing is different. Like even the dances are different. It's very like um, horrible what we did on stage performances in recent fifty years. 
because we we cleaned all these regional specificities of all these uh, different like parts of Uyghur culture, and then we tried to make one Uyghur culture. But what what I really like is there's hundreds and thousands of different Uyghur culture, and that's the power of Uyghur culture, and that amazes me. But the the problem is everyone is like trying to forget about those differences. We try to just become one, but which is artificial for me, I think. Um, you can be different and one at the same time. It's not a problem. Mm. But uh, if you become one, you will give up on thousands of others. You asked like two questions, right? The, what was the second one? Um, so you answered which parts that you appreciate um, what don't you appreciate? Uh, <clears throat> what I don't appreciate is um, we try to become westernized or become like we try to do western classical music with Uyghur traditional music because we think like Uyghur traditional music is very simple and good, not good enough or we try to like put it in big orchestras and or sing it with two 200 singers and and that all means that you don't understand enough your culture uh, western classical music developed in 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 its own environment and with all this history and in it in its own path as Uyghur music as well it is also modern i mean it's also contemporary because people are playing it now it's not something already dead. Uyghur music, what we call traditional music, is as contemporary as John Cage. I mean, it's the same, like people are playing it in the same time. That means it's modern, and but it's different. It's different. It's not because it doesn't fit in Western standard. It's not modern. I think what I have problem with is not respecting equally all different sounds, all different instruments in their own specific uh, identity. That's something bothers me, I think. Okay. Um, do you have anything you want to say to our listeners? Um, I think I want to say, don't be afraid. And I have faith on, on our youth. And I think... We are awesome people and we are also like very creative and creative young generation. So don't be afraid. Just go for it. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, I just have five questions, like one sentence. Okay. Answers. Okay. Um, what book do you like to gift to people? Um. I really like the uh, Thadarta of Herman Hesse. Oh, yeah. I have that book on my yeah. shelf. <laughs> so if there's one book that I, I have to give to someone, I think that, that will be the one. Uh, what are your favorite hobbies or other interests that you are passionate about? Other hobbies that I'm passionate about? Painting. Oh, yeah. Um, what do you paint? Watercolors? Watercolors, yeah. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite Uyghur art? Um, whether it's a song, literature, poetry? If I have to say one, uh, the song of Sanubar Tursun, Ademler Uluh. It's a very powerful song. Okay. Do you have a link to that song somewhere? Uh, yeah, on Spotify, you can find it. It's it, um, In English, it's uh, People Are gr Glorious, the title. Um, what is the best thing that you've bought for uh, under 100 euros? <laughs> it's, it's not easy because um, I work a lot with machines, so it's not under 100 euros. Yeah, fair. <laughs> so... Uh... So I think my pen and my uh, my notebooks made out of uh, recycling paper. Okay. Um, 
what's the best way for people to reach you or see more of your work? Um, there's a YouTube channel that I put um, some videos on. So Mukadas Mijit. So you can type my name. And there's a website. I have a website as well on Wix. So but, uh, again, using my name, Mukadas Mijit, you can Google it. And there's a link that you can send me emails. So if someone wants to reach. And we'll also put those links. Uh, we'll put those links in the show notes as well. Thank you very much, Mokadas, for taking the time to speak with me and to speak with uh, you. young Uyghurs all around the world. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. I'm Thank proud you. of you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Tarim Talks, brought to you by the Tarim Network. Make sure you check out thetaramnetwork.com for more information about the Tarim Network and Tarim Talks, as well as seminars, classes, and ways to meet other Uyghurs around the world. If you'd like, you can also subscribe to this podcast through any major podcast supplier, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. <laughs>